two, one. And I'm gonna play my dramatic. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. There he is, from the SETI Institute in Mountain View. How are you, Seth? Well, I'm uh, possibly okay. I think I'm all right. <laughs> Still above ground. That's what people tell me is the correct answer. <laughs> yeah, I always say, you know, people say, oh, it's my birthday. And I'm just like, well, another year older, but I guess it's better than the alternative of not getting older. Uh, you're perennially ju uh, you know, juvenile, but in a good sense, youthful. Seth, you never seem to age. It must be studying, you know, the billions of year old cosmos that you and I both study. Uh, it's always a treat to be with you, and I thank you. This is Alien Week on the Into the Impossible podcast. Yesterday we had on Mick West, uh, noted uh, debunker or classifier of, uh, of unidentified alien phenomena or unidentified flying phen phenomena. And I made, made note today on Twitter that he got his start. Uh, he was a video game designer, and he started off by making uh, Tony Hawk's a video game which uh, has to do with an identified flying object have you ever seen tony hawk he like hovers in space and like orbits and and rotates around so that's pretty cool and uh i thought we'd talk a little bit about it because you know in the news lately are all these uh phenomena have to do with with uh with potential alien techno signatures in the form of of ufos and i'm hoping to have on some of the uh some of the uh, pilots of various military aircraft that have come to uh, to be uh, featured in 60 Minutes and other fora, uh, and uh, and hopefully we'll get some of your feedback on it. So, have you had a chance to see any of the the, the footage from from these uh, military uh, infrared cameras or any of the other uh, eyewitness accounts? Have you followed any of that, Seth? Well, I have looked at the uh, the better known videos. Maybe they're the only ones. At least three different, maybe four different ones. Several made with these FLIR, F-L-I-R, which means, you know, forward-looking infrared cameras, uh, you know, rotating Tic Tacs and stuff like that, things setting over or settling into the ocean, stuff like that. Yeah, I have seen them. Still there? I, I don't hear any. I don't actually hear you. I think that something is... Sorry, I muted myself for a second. Oh, it was not. It was not the military. Not this time. No, could have been the aliens, though. <laughs> so, yeah, so you haven't seen any of those. Yeah, there there are some, you know, ones that are more credible than others. I, I tend to think I'm a pilot. You remember you you met me at the airport once I flew a little plane up there. And, and when I spoke at the SETI Institute and one of the things I, you know, kind of have, have thought about is, you know, has anyone looked at the simulation, not of the of the UFOs? But of actually the pilots and what they would have experienced from inside of a of a high performance jet vehicle capable of almost Mach two speeds, they're not designed to go super slow, and they're not designed to you know cruise very low over the ocean. But I want to point out that in your book, Confessions of an Alien Hunter, which I am going to bring up a picture of as we speak, because I have that technology and I have it at my fingertips. I'm going to bring up the cover of it. I love this book. I read it. I listened to it. I read it in Kindle. I think I have a signed copy by you too. It could um, be. All these things. It's now a collector's item. One of the editions, on the, the so-called collector's item edition on Amazon is like $500, as is one of Mick West's books. So that's pretty cool. But anyway, um, you talk about what would be the implications if true. So first thing I hear, Seth, a lot, why are they visiting us now? And so what you've said in the book, and I want you to elaborate on it, one reason purported by uh, people that are enthusiasts about the alien actually explanation is that they see our path as one of heading towards destruction. They see the blast of nuclear uh, detonations in the 50s, 60s, etc., and they see us on a path towards destruction and they come to save us in a certain sense. How do you respond to that? Well, uh, you know, one could argue at length that the aliens probably don't care what we do to ourselves any more than I care what the mosquitoes outside this building are doing. Uh, maybe they're doing things that are not in their best interest, but I'm not going to go out there and try and save them. So you could argue that, but that, that's an argument about 
alien sociology, right? And we don't know much about that. So what I would say is this, just let's just stick with the physics. Uh, yeah, maybe they've seen our nuclear tests and they go back to 1945, right? I mean, it turns out that it's a lot harder to find somebody's nuclear test than it is to find their radars because the radars are on 24 seven. The nuclear tests are over pretty quickly, but you know, leave all that out. Maybe they, they did see the uh, detonations beginning in 1945, you know, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Nevada, all the places where we set off atomic bombs. Maybe they did, let's assume. So that means 1945, since 1945, 55, 65, 75, 70, 76 years ago. All right, so it's just going out into this information, the flashes are going out into space at the speed of light and they hit a planet where there's some Klingons on there and they say, well, oh my God, you know, these guys have nuclear weapons. We got to do something about it. Sure, it's going to cost 70 trillion zillion galactic cruceros to do it, but we're going to do it, right? Okay, so what they're going to do is they're going to send some saucers to Earth to fly around. I, I, as far as I can tell, they haven't done anything when, with regard to our nuclear capabilities, but let's say that they just decided to do that. Well, okay, their spacecraft can't go faster than the speed of light. That's the limit. So let's assume they go at the speed of light, right? 76 years uh, to for them to uh, get the information, another 76 years to get back here or whatever. Uh, it's That wouldn't work because we wouldn't see them yet. But what if they were half that far away? Instead of 76 years, right, they were uh, 38 light years away, right? So... All right, the bombs go off 38 light, sorry, 38 years later, they see the flash, they make a quick decision, we're gonna intervene, and it takes them 38 years to get here at best, mm. right? So that means they have to be within 38 light years of us. And the total number of stars within 38 light years is, well, it's a few thousands, a few tens of thousands. That's a small number in astronomy. And the chances that there's some you know, civilization with these capabilities within that distance strike me as rather small. So I think it's remarkable that they're here. And it's, the argument is even stronger if you go back to you know, sightings seen in the late 40s or early 50s. And it becomes almost impossible for them to be here on the basis of anything they might know about uh, humanity. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they're coming here for exploitation of some resources uh, that they might need or that they might want to, uh, you know, extract from us in, in some sort of conserved quantity that they might lack. Is there any reason to expect that aliens might have, we might have something that aliens want, perhaps a Kardashian or two? Yeah, well, well if they took them, I mean, I'd, I'm not sure my life would be altered greatly. But, uh, you know, I've, I've been on panels where we discuss what what do we have to offer the aliens? In the movies, it's often water, but that's kind of a stupid thing for them to come here to get because water, you know, what does it make? Weigh 65 pounds per square or per cubic foot or whatever. Water is very dense. It's, it's heavy and it's expensive to get it. And the facts are the universe is chock-a-block with water because water is H2O. You know, hydrogen is three quarters of the universe by weight. So there's plenty of hydrogen out there. And oxygen is the third most common uh, element in the universe. So H2O is everywhere. We find it everywhere in the solar system. It's going to be everywhere in their solar system. They're not going to come here for water any more than I'm going to, you know, walk to Tibet to get lunch. I can get lunch a lot more easily than walking to the bed. So, and, and these panels kind of discuss, uh, kind of came to the conclusion that it was actually nothing in terms of resources that they could find here that they couldn't find much, much near by their home planet. So that doesn't make sense. Uh, they might come here to uh, breed with us. That's a frequent theme. It's a frequent theme because, you know, it's something that scares people. And that's why it's often offered is what the aliens are here to do. But it wouldn't work. You know, it wouldn't work any more than you could, you know, uh, kidnap a, a roach from your garage and, and breed with it. You're not going to be able to do that. And it's going to be uncomfortable. So that's, that's not a reasonable uh, scenario for them coming here. There's essentially nothing. We have culture that they might be interested in. You know, they like uh, what they find in the art museums and so forth. They don't have exactly that. They might take that. Or maybe they're just here as explorers. You know, they just want to know what's in the galaxy. That's fair enough. But then why now? And finally, they might uh, 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 just be coming here to proselytize. They want to convert us to the galactic church. That's something that's certainly incentivized a lot of our exploration. Mm -hmm. Now, some say that's exactly what we'd expect you to say, because the SETI Institute is not prepared, even if this uh, were to be true, uh, because you are used to searching for electromagnetic signals, which is kind of uh, your, your grandmother's type of technology. You're not used to searching for techno signatures. 
the type that uh, Avi Loeb, past guest on the Into the Impossible podcast, has spoken about. Um, what do you say? Is there a protocol? Let's say this turns out to be actually what it is depicted by many of the proponents of the alien uh, visitation hypotheses. Uh, is there a protocol or are we basically going to start, you know, kind of, uh, you know, building the building the roadmap as uh, as they introduce themselves for dinner? Yeah, well, I think so. I think the latter. Uh, I have been asked, I don't know how many times, does the Pentagon have some sort of protocol, if you like that term, for dealing with, uh, you know, visitors from outer space? I, I don't know what's in the depths of the Pentagon. I've been in the Pentagon many times, actually, because I lived two miles from it. and My father worked for the Navy. And as a consequence, I used to go over to the Pentagon to uh, use the swimming pool, that kind of thing. But that doesn't tell you what they're doing there. I don't know what they're doing there. But I doubt that there's a protocol because, in fact, it's just a very simple argument. If they can come here, it, it doesn't matter what your protocol is. Whatever they want to do, they can do it because they have the technology to do things that are centuries away, if not farther, for us. So it, it's uh, you know, a bit silly. It would be like the, uh, the Native Americans on Watling Island in the Caribbean in 1492. Do they have a protocol in case some Spanish ships come over the horizon? I, I don't think they did. They didn't anticipate it. But in any case, if they did have a protocol, it wouldn't have mattered. I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the, these guys get out of the ship and they look at them and they, you know, uh, try and talk at one another and neither one can understand the other and so forth. So I, I doubt that there's a protocol, but it doesn't matter if there is. The only protocol that would uh, work is maybe to negotiate. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, some of the research that's done at the SETI Institute, which I urge folks to support, as I do, I'm a long term donor, uh, I'm not only a client, I'm also a member, uh, but the SETI Institute has done pioneering work on what's called extremophiles and so forth. We used to think that, you know, life was very chauvinistically would have to look like us. On the cover of your book is a three fingered, one thumbed, four digited uh, alien finger, you know, kind of handprint. Um, we don't now think that aliens or even life has to look very much like us. Talk about the research that your colleagues have done at the SETI Institute on extremophiles that suggest that life could survive radiation hardened environments, uh, deep sea environments, acidic environments. Talk about how life finds a way, as Dr. Jeff Goldblum described in Jurassic Park. Yes, well, Jeff had that line written for him. Well, uh, indeed, <laughs> life is tough. No spoilers, I mean, I come that it, on. So. It's not, <laughs> what's it? not much of a spoiler. Uh, you know, once you get life started, it's very hard to stop it. I mean, you, you think of what's happened on the Earth. Of course, there were the ice ages. Oh, yeah, there was that big rock that uh, landed 66 million years ago in the Mexican Yucatan and, you know, wiped out the dinos and essentially three-fourths of everything else. You know, that, that was a bad day. Uh, we've had snowball Earth episodes at least once where the whole planet is covered in ice and so forth. None of this is, has, has stopped life. Yeah, it, it slows it down. You know, uh, you, you, lose, <laughs> you lose those big sauropods with their big teeth. Yeah, yeah, but life goes on. So that's a very obvious demonstration of the fact that once you get life started, it, it, you know, it just spreads around and it just fills all the niches that it can. And it's very hard to get rid of. So, uh, you know, I, I think the real question is not, can life survive? And that's uh, the study of extremophiles. You know, you find bacteria and the fuel tanks of jet liners and stuff like that. Uh, it isn't whether they can survive. The real question is, can you get it started in the first place? Because if you don't do that, it doesn't matter whether it could have survived. The question is, how do you get life started? And that's, that's a difficult subject because the uh, evidence is always uh, very, very tenuous because you know, single cell organisms don't make great fossils. So we don't know how that happens. And, you know, we, we're, we're interested, for example, in, you know, finding life on Mars and everybody knows about the Perseverance rover uh, rolling around the landscapes of, the, of our little ruddy buddy out there, you know, trying to find evidence for life and it might do so or it might not do so. You should ask yourself, what happens if it doesn't find life, right? that there was once bacterial life on, on Mars. That would be a big downer. Because if we find it, we can say, okay, well, at least it looks like getting biology started isn't so hard. Mm. And yeah, exactly. I want to look at that. You know, people talk about all well, finding evidence of water. Actually, just today, there was an announcement of uh, two missions to go to Venus. And I've had uh, Sarah Seeger on the podcast, um, hoping to have uh, Jane Greaves, uh, authors of Venus, 
uh, phosphine discovery. What have you made about that? We haven't spoken since those discoveries were announced uh, late last year. Um, does that uh, does, does that obviously the NASA missions were long in the planning? They're they're not just sort of the responding to you know late late last year's news. Although that would not be a, a bad uh, reason to to develop the mission. Uh, NASA is less kind of reactionary than that. But um, but what do you make of the possibility of life on Venus as an extremophile or as an, uh, a different modality to look for uh, missions to go to Mars? What do you make of these missions? Are they even looking for life, first of all? Well, I think that they, they are, at least one of them is, because they're looking for this phosphine, this gas that was found in the atmosphere of Venus at an altitude, you know, like uh, 20 miles up or something like that, where the temperatures are, you know, completely comparable to the te uh, temperatures in Austin, Texas. I mean, they're very, you know, they're okay. They can support, they can support life. And the phosphine gas itself was a clue because phosphine is, is a hard gas to make, or at least it's not made frequently by many reactions in volcanoes. Volcanoes make phosphine and bacteria make phosphine. So if there's phosphine there, the question is, well, where it come from? It could come from volcanoes, but if you just do the numbers, it turns out you'd need to have Venus completely pockmarked with volcanoes, active volcanoes, in order to account for the phosphine. That doesn't seem to be the case. And the other possibility is it was made by bacteria floating in the in, in the upper atmosphere of Venus where the temperatures are salubrious, salubrious and so forth. Uh, that's extremely enticing because that shows you an example of where life got started, where the conditions were really horrid, but it still got started somehow. Well, for me, the problem is that the detection of phosphine, I think, is somewhat tenuous because it involved uh, some spectral work, radio spectral work, and they, they fitted a ninth order polynomial or something to the spectrum. And I, I've done a lot of that sort of research, and you never fit a ninth order polynomial to any, uh, any spectrum that you've obtained uh, with a radio telescope because you can fit anything. So anyhow, as I, I think the thing is, NASA decided to go Venus, to Venus because Venus has been kind of, uh, you know, in the background here for a long time. It's been Mars, 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 and more Mars. And now there are two things going to Venus. It's a tough environment. It's hot there, but doggone it. I think it's going to be interesting. Yeah, if it can cruise around in the clouds of Venus, you know, that uh, could, could add a nice, uh, a nice blurb to NASA's resume. Uh, so, uh, so people are, are, are talking about other uh, other aspects. A question that you and I talked about earlier in a recorded interview that we did for later retransmission on the same Into the Impossible Network station. I'm a reminder, I'm talking to uh, Dr. Seth Shostak of the SETI Institute in Northern California, a good friend of the show and a host of the Big Picture Science podcast and radio show and you should all subscribe to that as well and follow him on twitter and other social media outlets we were talking earlier about you know why use electromagnetism at all as a search for uh, as a search modality and people are asking that as well uh, in the uh, in, in the in the chat as as we speak so you want to talk a little bit about that we we did discuss that earlier today but for the benefit of the audience members who uh, aren't uh, able to travel back in time with us uh, is it possible to, you know, that we're too kind of uh, recency focused? You know, there's this primacy recency bias that human beings have that the most recent thing that we encounter, we're going to fixate and sink all of our resources into. Uh, might it be that we should think other ways of, of, of searching for extraterrestrial intelligence other than the shiny newest thing that we just invented? Well, it, it, you know, that's an, uh, an enticing thought. Right, that we're too anthropocentric, we're too fixated on the technology of the day. And the technology of the day, and when I say day, I mean the last maybe century or something, is uh, electromagnetic radiation. In other words, radio waves, lasers, anything like that. And uh, you could say, well, maybe, you know, 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now, we'll look back and think, oh, that's so quaint. They were using this, you know, this silly technology of the time to find the aliens. And meanwhile, they're on. Uh, you know, some other transformational, I don't know, I can't even remember uh, the, the terms that are used in science fiction for these communication modes that go faster than the speed of light. There is no such communication mode as far as we know. Tachyonic? As far as we know. Well, tachyons, yes. A lot of people seem to think that quantum entanglement would uh, allow instantaneous communication, but that's a misunderstanding of quantum entanglement. It doesn't actually allow that. But be that as it may, you go with, with, the, you go with the science you have. So that explains why all these experiments are always using 
if you will, the trendy science of the day, because, you know, that's the best science they've got. And, and I think that that applies here. Mm -hmm. Very good. So another question uh, that I'm getting is, you know, if they had advanced uh, technology that could potentially, you know, outdo our technology, et cetera, traveling uh, throughout the galaxy, perhaps uh, that, you know, as they would travel, wouldn't they encounter many, many hazards along the way? You know, we think about uh, the uh, Star Wars, you know, kind of the, the warp drives of Star Trek, Star Wars. Uh, but aren't there other hazards of interstellar travel, even if they could master warp drive and handle that that very, very perilous deceleration phase at the very end? Uh, are there other hazards, aren't there other hazards rather from just basic physical principles that they would have to face uh, along their journey at close to the speed of light? Well, if they're going, you know, <laughs> with the physics we know, which it says is to say they're not going quite the speed of light, let alone, you know, three times the speed of light, whatever, uh, then they're moving through space very fast. And you could say, well, so what? I mean, space is empty and it is largely empty, but it's not entirely empty. Uh, there's there's what's called interstellar material in space. And even in the, you know, the the, the most unappealing, the deserts, if you will, of, of the Milky Way, you still have at least one particle per cubic centimeter, right? There are always particles of hydrogen, if you will, particles. They're just atoms of hydrogen. And normally they wouldn't bother you. They don't bother me. I don't disturb my sleep or anything. So what would these, uh, you know, atoms of hydrogen, they're actually little molecules, of two had, uh, atoms of hydrogen, you know, and they hit the spacecraft at 99.9% .9 the speed of light or whatever, and they're going to punch through the uh, the skin of the spacecraft, punch through you and, you know, disrupt the cells in your body and you probably just kill yourself. So uh, there are hazards of going through space at very high speed. And the mitigation for that, uh, according to your most recent guest uh, on the show, or at least at the Institute, Michio Kaku su suggests that There'd be no reason for physical entities for aliens to travel at all whatsoever. In fact, there'd be uh, just a digital code, an avatar uh, that you would be beamed literally, but only in digital code. A clone Seth would be traversing, traipsing about the galaxy. Uh, what do you make of that uh, as, a, as a prospect? And perhaps now we're back to electromagnetic formula, uh, formulations of extraterrestrial intelligence as a detectable signature. Yeah, well, I think it makes sense in some... You know, to, to some degree, I mean, you know, the number of base pairs in your DNA, in other words, the information in your DNA would fit on a CD. You don't even need a DVD, just a CD, right? Oh, oh so, that's, uh, so, sorry, I use Betamax, damn it. Uh, yeah, well, that's too bad, but you, you, you're probably not recording your entire uh, genome, but you could fit that onto a CD. So it's not a lot of information. You could broadcast it into space, you know, in the course of minutes. So... Why send the baryons when you can? Send, why just send the? Why don't you just send the information? If somebody across the country has a book that uh, they want me to read, they could mail the book, or they could send me a PDF file, if you will, right? And they, by doing that, it gets to me much more quickly and at lower cost to everybody involved. So, uh, I think what uh, Professor Kaku was saying is that you know, we won't build rockets to go into space. We'll just send the information. Now, you could take that CD of Brian Keating, right? And, you know, your DNA and just send that to some other place and say, well, now, you know, Brian's going into space at the speed of light, which he would be, but it does presume that at the other end, at the alien end, that they can do something with that sequence of your DNA. Do they know what to do with it? Do they know that, okay, so now I need a, a, a you know, a phosphorus atom here and a nitrogen atom there and so forth and so on. Could, could they reconstruct it at the other end? Maybe not. I mean, I don't know how clever they are, but they might not be able to do that. They might not be able to figure it out. And if they did, even if they did, what they would end up with is Brian Keating's genome. And, uh, you know, they'd culture that on a Petri disc. And then they would get Brian Keating as he was when he was born with essentially no information. They would miss the college education. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that reminds me that I... I did send you a copy of my book, uh, but it wasn't read in any form, uh, let alone in digital form. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. You, you did, you did, of course, support support me when we were last together at the SETI Institute uh, about two years ago with Alex Filipenko of UC Berkeley Astronomy. Question from Scott Brown, ITF <clears throat> in the flesh. I don't know what that stands for. Uh, uh, he asked, "Does Seth feel that the idea of an advanced race of beings or life forms observing 
and interacting with hum with humans is completely impossible? And if so, why? Well, I don't think it's completely impossible, but it's, you know, it's not going to be like it is on TV where they just sort of stand in front of you and, you know, talk to you in, in, in perfect colloquial American English. They don't even have British accents. Always wondered about that. But in any case, yeah, I, and I think we could interact at, at a certain minimum level of IQ, if you will. I mean, I can't interact, for example, with the the hummingbirds in my backyard very well. And I walk out there and they know I'm there. They've, they've seen me, they sense my presence and I sense theirs because they immediately begin to uh, defending their territory, which usually includes my entire backyard. Uh, I, I, you know, they didn't pay that mortgage. But in any case, there's some level of interaction always possible. Uh, but in terms of communication, that takes a little bit longer. I think if they had any interest in that, uh, they would, you know, give us a picture dictionary or something like that. And maybe we could find some com common, you know, denominator, if you will, in language. But language is already something that's slightly anthropocentric. So uh, I don't know, but I, I cannot imagine that we'd find some other creatures and couldn't uh, communicate with them in some ways. I mean, you know, we understand a little bit about dolphins are doing when they come up and ask for another fish. So I think at some level, you, you might be able to, to uh, communicate. What do you make of uh, Professor Adam Frank's suggestion that uh, one way to look for uh, this uh, civilization of, uh, you know, is by looking for a techno signature in the form of uh, atmospheric chemistry changes via uh, terraforming, global warming, atmospheric chemistry, methane signatures, et cetera. What do you make of that hypothesis? Well, I mean, that, that's certainly interesting. I actually have a paper that's in Astrobiology Magazine, I think in January. Anyhow, when I say that actually maybe a better way to do SETI is to indeed look for artifacts because then the aliens don't have to be alive now. It's like, I think I make an analogy. It's like finding the pharaohs of Egypt. Very hard to do. I mean, they are there. They've just been moved to a new museum, but they're just lying in a box not making much noise. So it's, it's maybe less than satisfying, but at least you could find the pharaohs in, in a sense. But a better way would just be to go to the outskirts uh, on the west side of Cairo and you'd find these big pointy buildings and you say, well, I, you know, the pharaohs have built this uh, thousands of years ago. And so this is good evidence. I mean, I, I think you could do that, but the idea that you could find, for example, uh, hydrofluorocarbons in our atmosphere because of hairspray or whatever, uh, and it's something that doesn't belong in our atmosphere and they would do spectral analysis and, and find that stuff. I, I think that's maybe a little too simple because actually how long were the fluorocarbons in our atmosphere? You know, it, it was recognized as a problem was destroying the ozone and they were, you know, they, that, that problem was solved within a few decades mm -hmm. at most. So most of the things that are in our atmosphere that would indicate that we are here, things that we're responsible for in the atmosphere are very short lived, right? Even global warming, all that CO2, right? The, the, the hope is that we will solve that problem within, you know, 50 years, 100 years, 500 years, whatever. And so the fraction of time that a planet would have these kinds of signatures in its atmosphere strikes me as fairly, fairly low. Mm -hmm. So uh, Cryptolicious, <clears throat> which was the name I was going to choose for my second born child, uh, is asking, uh, Seth, you have unlimited funds. Let, let's not make it unlimited because I, I think that's a little bit of a stretch. But let, let's say you have uh, uh, 2x the Allen Telescope Array funds. Uh, you have uh, one new project that you can spend it on. Only one. You can't develop an endowment for the, the Seth Shostak uh, library wing and uh, endowed, uh, endowed uh, hovercraft. You have one project. What do you spend it on? Well, uh, if it's just twice what was spent to build the Allen Telescope Array, then I would use that money to build the Allen Telescope Array. I would, I would finish it. The original design had 350 antennas. In fact, we have 42. And with 350 antennas, it's, it, it's actually a qualitative change in what it could do. So if you're talking about that order of magnitude, that's, you know, under $100 million. So with that order of magnitude, that's what I would do. If you really had unlimited funds, if that's really the question, uh, you know, you'd put, uh, you'd put some sensitive radio telescopes on the backside of the moon, the side we don't see from Earth, because that would be shielded from all the interference here on our mm. home planet. And, uh, you know, it'd be radio quiet and you'd have a much better chance of finding something. Mm. My uh, first guest on the Into the Impossible podcast uh, was my late great friend Freeman Dyson. And uh, Starduster is asking, how would you go about searching for a Dyson sphere? I think that's a cool question. 
Yeah, well, a warm question, actually. Uh, it's uh, it's it's actually been done many times. People have tried this, and they've looked, people have looked for, if you will, uh, Dyson spheres in the galaxy. In other words, and for those who don't know what a Dyson sphere is, it's just you, know, you say if you really want to solve the energy problem, what you do is you take a part of a planet that's not so useful to you, like Neptune, and you just rebuild it as a shell around the Earth, way beyond the orbit of the Earth, so you don't interfere with the Earth. And uh, you just align it with uh, solar cells that, you know, turn the sun's energy into, well, electrical energy, and you just, you know, radio that back to Earth. So now you have all the energy you can possibly use, much more than you can possibly use. And, uh, you know, there are no emissions and no waste products, no pile of ash at the other side of the boiler. I mean, you know, and so Dyson said that this is what advanced societies would do. And these things are in principle detectable because the outside of these things always emit some infrared. And people have looked for infrared in, uh, you know, in surveys of the Milky Way. And they find a few things. The trouble is that infrared is produced in many star systems because of dust. So it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, let's see, we have more questions coming in from, uh, do you believe that uh, intelligence is an evolutionary advantage or a disadvantage? And do we expect it to be rare or common outside of Earth? I, I guess that's predicated on a prior of whether or not you think life is common outside of the Earth or not. Well, I mean, I, th I think that it is a somewhat different question than saying, you know, is a biology going to be common? I mean, we could answer that if we found any evidence for previous biology on, on Mars, but it, it's rather doubtful that there was ever intelligence on Mars, <laughs> although maybe Elon Musk will change that soon. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a very legitimate question, actually, and it's one that uh, the, for which the answer is not very clear. You could say that nature's not interested in intelligence, right? We've had life on this planet for four billion years, roughly, and for almost all of that, none of the life was very clever, <laughs> right? Never building anything, no technology, no smelting of metals, any of that. Right. So nature's not interested in intelligence. And, and that's a thesis you can prove to yourself by walking around your neighborhood. Nature's not interested in intelligence, but it is interested in survival. So if intelligence increases your chances of survival, then, you know, nature will go along. And that's what's happened. I mean, obviously, humans have come to dominate the planet. And, uh, you know, our simian friends and ancestors, they're, they're pretty clever compared to most life on Earth. Uh, and there are other, I mean, crows are pretty clever and dolphins are pretty clever and so forth. So it looks like nature does keep trying, or it doesn't try, but it allows the evolution of intelligence in species. And if it turns out to pay off, then it, it keeps making that. So I, I think that intelligence might be very, very common, but there's no proof of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to ask yourself, if the dinos hadn't been wiped out 66 million years ago, there would still be dinosaurs here and they, they weren't really all that smart. Yeah, absolutely. So let's see, we've got, um, right. Uh, looking out uh, further. So I don't think you commented very much on uh, Oumuamua uh, lately. Is that something we can discuss? There's some interest in that from some of my listeners. Is Oumuamua credible? Is it more likely that it comes from a techno as a techno signature or of a naturally occurring a phenomenon within our solar system or an exosolar system as a uh, icy body or something like that. And then I'll have a follow-up about icy bodies later. Okay. Actually, I'm supposed to be in another meeting at this point, oh. so I may have to bomb <laughs> out. But let me, let me just say this. Amu uh, you know, Albie Loeb at Harvard, after all, this is, he's a very smart guy, uh, has said that uh, Amu Amu might be a solar sail or some remnant from somebody else's solar system. It's clear that it comes from somebody else's solar system. What's not clear is that it's some sort of manufactured item. And we'll never know because Oumuamua was seen when it was al already on its way out of the solar system. And, uh, you know, it was only seen as a dot, one pixel in the camera. So pretty hard to say what it was. And actually the colors of this thing, and you could measure the colors, were very consistent with it being an asteroid. So I think most people in the uh, research community think that's what it was. But you have to say, gee, that's pretty lucky. You know, somebody throws a rock into space and it comes right into our solar system uh, as closely as it did. It just, you know, wheeled around the sun and headed on out. And the chances of that happening are very small unless there are a lot of these rocks. And I think the answer to a mill mill will become clear if we, in fact, find more rocks. And we're beginning to do that. 
All right, so the last question, if you'll indulge me, Seth, is a follow-up to that. So Avi has said that there'll be many of these discovered with Vera Rubin, space, uh, Vera Rubin Observatory and that we should send CubeSats to go do it. And I said, well, it'd be great you know, if you knew a billionaire who happens to want to send you know, spacecraft to Proxima Centauri, just get him to send the money to go chase after Oumuamua, catch up to it pretty quickly. Do you think we should be spending money to chase after these potential techno signatures or spend more money observing them with upcoming obser astronomical observatories? Well, the, the latter, to just keep an eye out, is not anything that costs money because we're doing it anyhow. I mean, it costs money, but that money is there. If you were to go to somebody like uh, Gary Milner, indeed, and, and ask for money to catch up with Amua Amua, I, I'm not sure that's actually worthwhile. I mean, it's very unlikely that if Amua Amua was, you know, deliberately sent this way, that it's the last thing to be deliberately sent this way. You have to ask yourself, we finally had a telescope there on the, uh, on the island of Hawaii that could find something like Amua Amua, and it found it within a year or two of opening up. So if there's only one of them, that's a tremendous coincidence in time. So I think, uh, you know, it's very hard to build a rocket to catch up with the moon. None of our rockets could. You'd have to build a whole loom rocket. And, uh, you know, I, I think you do better to spend the money on observations. That's right. Well, Seth, I know you have to go. Thank you for being so generous. I point out I have another interview with Seth we recorded earlier. That'll be out. Tune in. Subscribe to Seth's podcast, Big Picture Science. And the SETI Institute YouTube channel is available. Subscribe, donate to the SETI Institute as I do. Seth, I want to thank you so much. I'll stick around, answer a couple more comments and questions from my audience. Love uh, talking to you, Seth, as always. Have a wonderful day. Say hi to Jill Tarter and Frank Drake, and hopefully we'll get you back on soon. Thanks so much, Seth. Thank you, Brian. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, so I'll stick around and answer any potential questions that I can answer in the chat room. This is so much fun talking to Seth. I did do an interview with him beforehand. We talked for almost an hour about the book itself, <clears throat> Confessions of an Alien Hunter. It's pretty funny. We've been talking a lot about aliens this week, and I do hope I will have on uh, at least one of the two pilots uh, who is involved in the famous Tic Tac video recorded not too uh, far away from uh, not too far away from where I am here in San Diego off the coast of uh, uh, San Clemente Island where there's a naval air station uh, by Commander uh, Fravor and uh, Alex Dietrich and others and two F-18 Hornets. These are renowned pilots and they're nobody uh, to scoff at. We did a record yesterday with Mick West and you can find that video in the recorded yesterday um, uh, or recent uploads live videos and i'm hoping to have frank drake on i'm going to ask uh, seth to indulge me and put me in touch with frank drake because one of the things i always talk about is how when you talk about the drake equation which is quite frequently brought up and pointed to as an example of um, how numerous how populous life should be in the solar system in the not in the solar system in the galaxy and perhaps in other galaxies uh, it's never analyzed with respect to the error bar associated with that number in other words, Drake's equation, which uh, you know has become the kind of the talisman, and Frank just celebrated his uh, his one recent birthday recently uh, at uh, at the SETI Institute. And the Drake equation is about sixty years old. I think it's exactly sixty years old, and it's about a six-term equation. It gives the number of civilizations at which there should be life, and perhaps technologically sophisticated life, not some sort of amoeba. Uh, like my friend or f a former guest on the show, Andy Weir, talks about in Project Hail Mary. That's an actual technological uh, advanced civilization that we could communicate with or hear signals from in the form that Seth and his colleagues uh, use radio detection uh, to, uh, to attempt to detect. And the equation is given as a product of certain terms, lifetime of a civilization, number of stars produced, uh, and so forth. Um, and, and But it's never mentioned what the uncertainty in each one of those terms is. And actually, we've gotten very good at reducing the uncertainty in certain, ones, uh, certain of those terms. In other words, the Kepler satellite has, has calculated and measured the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy that host planets in habitable zones where liquid water uh, would be expected to exist. It's quite normal uh, to understand that. We now know that better than Frank Drake could have ever imagined back in 1961. However, other terms, they're complete ignorance. But how do you know what the lifetime, average lifetime of a civilization is? So I think it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite interesting that these equations I would never accept from one of my beloved undergraduates here at UC San Diego. And I point that out. 
Uh, and it's not to be ridiculed. Edwin Hubble produced his famous Hubble diagram, which expresses the redshift distance relationship between distance gal distant galaxies. He expressed it uh, as an XY plot where uh, on the X axis was, was distance, on the Y axis was recessional velocity, and there were no error bars on that plot either. <laughs> and yet it was absolutely correct. In other words, distant galaxies are moving away at a greater speed the farther away they are from the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and it was done with uh, exactly no treatment of so-called propagation of errors. And it was actually overestimated by a factor of seven, which led, as I describe in my book, my book, um, to an overestimate uh, of this expansion rate led to an underestimate of the age of the universe because things are so far apart that they didn't need as much time to get as far away from the Milky Way as we observed them, uh, imputed them to be. Therefore, the Milky Way was thought to be seven times younger than it actually is now, known to be now, or about two billion years old, which meant that it was younger than the Earth was known to be back in 1929. So even something that is known to be wrong can have validity. It can point observers and theorists and, and experimentalists in a direction which later is proven to be right. I give an example of this recently on some interview I did, um, and that was Maxwell. James Kirk, Ma Maxwell is one of the greatest a uh, theoretical physicist in human history. And he came up with Maxwell's equations, which describe electromagnetism. And these equations are uh, uh, four equations that describe the interplay between uh, electric fields and charges, magnetic fields and currents, and then the interplay between a changing electric field and the magnetic field generated from that changing electric field, uh, and vice versa. And so it propagates through, uh, in substitution, you can actually generate and predict the existence of what are called electromagnetic waves or electromagnetic radiation. And this was a, a complete bolt from the blue. He never expected this to be the case. And of course it made him wonder, well, hmm, I don't ever uh, re recall a wave that existed without some medium in which it is waving. How can you have a wave, like a sound wave, it vibrates with air molecules, their density and pressure change in the medium and the air in which the sound waves are propagating? Uh, an ocean wave. You have an ocean wave, which is water, supports the wave, uh, oscill oscillating ocean wave that supports the energy propagation that we call longitudinal or ocean waves. Uh, those are also waves supporting a medium. So what supports the wave that he discovered in his equations, which are absolutely correct? The electromagnetic wave. Of course, we know it is. You can type it in the comment section. What is the, the medium that supports the electromagnetic oscillation phenomena? We'll put it there. Anyone put it there in the comments? First one there gets a starred comment and put up on the screen. Anybody put it in the comment section there? I'll take it with either spelling, ether spelling. Come on, that's a good joke, folks. Nobody's putting it up there. You guys are all talking about aliens. All right, fine. Nobody's going to say it. Ether. He basically thought of the ether, although he didn't call it that. He came up with a mechanistic support mechanism that would, sorry for the redundancy, that would support the, uh, the vibrations that would transmit, mechanically transmit the oscillating phenomena, basically vortices, gears, et cetera. Little tiny gears was the mechanism. Totally laughable. And you can imagine it. You can imagine if Twitter or YouTube or something existed back in the early uh, middle 1800s. Uh, he would have been mocked. He would have been shut down. He would have been canceled. And that would have led to the premature suffocation of an, of an ultimately proven correct theory. And so too, maybe with the Drake equation. Jim, yes, McManus, thank you. Um, uh, Andere, Andereantheris, thank you. Kuplex, yep, you guys all got it. Kieran, you guys are arguing too much in the chat room to get it, but it was ether or aether, exactly. And actually, the ether experiment was done at my alma mater, Case Western. Shout out to Cleveland, Ohio. Anyone in the chat room from Cleveland, put a thumbs up uh, because I, I love Cleveland, Ohio. And it was done by Michelson and Morley. Michelson was, of course, one of the first Americans, I think might have been the first to win a Nobel Prize in physics. And that was a null result experiment. It's a fascinating subject. Not only could the mechanism uh, that Maxwell proposed to support the perplexing uh, phenomena of electromagnetic radiation not be proven. In other words, there was no such thing as an ether. There was no such thing as a uh, as a gear or vortical mechanism supporting the mechanical oscillation of waves as as Maxwell thought there was, and that was required. But Michelson Morley could not detect the Earth's motion with respect to the ether wind. So at the time, it was considered 
the, uh, the most important failed experiment in human history. In other words, the failure to detect the ether wind was thought to be a failure of Michelson and Morley, not a correct experiment, which we now know. So sometimes a null result is actually more important than getting a positive result. And Einstein actually considered that one of the most important results that led to him ultimately coming up with the theory, special theory of relativity. So all this is to say that some of these uh, predictions and conjectures of things like the Drake equation and uh, that are ultimately maybe they're guides, maybe they're loose conjectures, uh, we shouldn't spend so much effort maybe uh, focusing so much on them. I mean, so much attention has gone into the Drake equation. Uh, there are books written. Adam Frank is coming uh, on the podcast. He's actually going to give like a webinar if you guys are interested in that. It'll be like a, a physics colloquium. I thought you guys are, are would we get a kick out of like, what do we do as actual physicists? I mean, you guys can't come into my lab. Uh, where it would be really cool to have kind of like a lab day someday. <laughs> Maybe we'll do that someday. Uh, but for now, or come to one of my telescopes in Chile or, or somewhere like that. But uh, but at some point, um, I would like to have like you guys come to my classes or hear like a guest lecture. And Adam Frank is one of the world's greatest lecturers and he's written great books. And so I really want you guys to attend it. So I'm going to set up like a webinar and Adam is going to give a webinar, a class, and he's going to give it based on this great uh, book that he wrote called Light of the Stars, in which he conjectures that we should use basically greenhouse gas emission as a form of SETI, as a form of searching for extraterrestrial, not intelligence, but uh, uh, intelligence needed to construct farming. One of the first forms of technology humans invented was agriculture. That led to a modification and, and geo- um, and geoengineering and reforming of our planet. You know, they say that that agriculture and, and livestock and, and, and cultivation is responsible for a great deal of, of, of a greenhouse and man-made, although a lot of it's bovine-made, global warming emissions and, and so forth. Um, and so why not look for those as a possible uh, signature of technology? Again, it's not like making an iPhone or a YouTube channel, uh, uh, but Nevertheless, it is a form of modification. So uh, we're going to have that uh, discussion in the next a week or two. Look for that from Professor Adam Frank, University of Rochester. I was thinking of doing it, as I say, like a class, like a webinar, like a colloquium, um, or we could have it as a, um, you know, just a standard uh, live stream. Uh, but, you know, sometimes I, I get fewer uh, subscriptions uh, or people actually unsubscribe for some reason from the live stream, which is not that great. And uh, I wanna give just an update on where the channel is going. I'm gonna have some very deep dives into uh, single topics. Look next week uh, for a very deep dive uh, from Dr. Delilah Gates. She is, I believe, the second African-American woman to get a PhD in uh, theoretical physics from Harvard University. And she's a world expert in um, black holes. And so she uh, uh, has given the, me the indulgence of, of doing two episodes of the Into the Impossible podcast. One is a deep dive into her thesis research on uh, the spin properties of uh, maximal uh, dynamical black hole properties, and that'll be of interest to nerds like me and many of you. And then one is kind of a black hole primer or primer, black holes 101, everything you want to know about black holes. Uh, she's brilliant. She happens to be the daughter of Jim Gates. Uh, who is a professor at Brown University, my alma mater for my PhD. And uh, he was, he's been a guest twice on the podcast. And uh, he is the president of the American Physical Society. Uh, and so it's really uh, delightful. I've had Andrurian and her daughter, Sasha Sagan, and I've now had on a father and daughter. Now I have to get on a mother and son. I don't know. I'm not going to get into all the genealogies, but whatever. We're going to get on all the different possible permutations that we can do. But anyway, Delilah is going to go deep into the physics of black holes. And uh, you're going to really like that. Everything you want to know about cosmic censorship, naked singularities, uh, black hole information paradox. We're going to have some awesome graphics custom made. I'm going to be doing stuff on loop quantum gravity, a deep dive there face-off, quantum gravity, uh, face-off. And then we're going to do a couple of deep dives into uh, chirality, Lorentz invariance, and, and finally we're going to go back and do a couple more interviews with uh, Craig Callender, who's a professor of uh, philosophy here at UC San Diego, uh, Anthony Aguirre, who is a professor at UC Santa Cruz, Go Banana Slugs, and he talks about uh, a wonderful book called Cosmological Koans, Ways to Understand the Cosmos Via... Uh, our nature of space and time. So let me go back up and answer some of your questions. Yay for black holes, of course. 
the live streams. You guys love them. Please share the channel with your friends. Um, as I said, sometimes uh, people unsubscribe, uh, and it's not just because they don't like uh, they don't like um, you know Mick West or whatever. As I said, I'm trying to get either uh, Commander Fravor and or Commander Dietrich on next week. I'd love to talk to Commander Dietrich because I've got daughters and they want to be pilots, and she's an amazing, amazing role model for them. And um, and she uh, was part of this event as well. And Fravor gets a lot more attention, and I'd love for her to get some attention too for some of the projects she's working on as well. Um, so uh, let me look through here what kind of things you guys are interested in. Uh, another a guest I'm thinking of having back on, uh, Roger Penrose. Yes, his birthday's coming up. He's turning 90. I'm going to have him back on. Thank you, Tim, for that suggestion. I'm speaking at his 90th birthday party. That's going to be really exciting. Yeah, Jim Gates, his daughter is... She, I, I am very happy that she's coming on my podcast for her first podcast. She's actually going to be on Nova, I believe. Um, so I'm going to be able to say, you guys are going to be able to say, you saw her first on Into the Impossible, Brian Keating. She is such an amazing, uh, brilliant human being. And she's just such a delight. I just love uh, uh, talking to her. Let me see if I have the thumbnail I can find from her somewhere here. But, uh, but, but share the channel with people. You know, it's, it's an educational channel, but it's also entertainment. I'm trying to... To bring that up yes lady blah blah thank you so much hit the like button leave comments i guess it, it helps the algorithm to get stuff on the whole sagan family yeah sasha has a brother love to get him on um noam chomsky i'm thinking of having him back on maybe with uh, some of these alien uh folks because he's spoken a lot about aliens communication he actually is an anti-alien he doesn't think aliens exist um he thinks the probability is almost zero my friend kurt jim has had him on many many times um but as i said i really um want to have this be the uh free university yeah joe rogan i don't think so um i'd love to i'd love to have him on um i don't know necessarily if he would even uh be aware of the of the channel but i think of this as you know as the only free university that you can attend in your pajamas where i get the best you know guest professors in the world Sometimes I'll do deep dives. I'll bring in some cool graphics. We have an awesome studio here that's coming back online. You're gonna see some cool green screen technology. Uh, I'm gonna mostly do in the science realm, but I'll throw in some current event stuff here and there and some science fiction. Um, but you know, you, the more you guys show show interest in things, I will, I will bring in um, the guests that you guys like. So let me know if you want Noam Chomsky, if you wanna hear from certain speakers. I'm having Jeremy England, who's a professor um, in Georgia. He wrote a book called Life is Fire, which is coming kind of like intelligent design, but from a Jewish perspective, counter uh, kind of in contrast to uh, the Stephen Meyer podcast, which is really interesting. And I appeared recently in a podcast called Unbelievable, which is a really big channel uh, with, um, with Stephen Meyer and I in debate. And um, yeah, Joe Rogan, you know, he's interesting. You know, I felt like, you know, a year ago, I looked back at my statistics and I had 2,000 subscribers and now I have 28,000. And I just, I, I, I really treasure every one of you guys. And people say, oh, well, like how many subscribers do you want? I'll tell you right now. I want 100,000 subscribers. And the reason why is very simple. It's not for like ego or whatever. When I talk to a publisher, uh, they say, how many subscribers do you have? They don't, they don't ask like, how bright are your subscribers? Who are your previous guests? I've had nine Nobel Prize winners on. Uh, I don't know a single podcast, even the Nobel, you know, committee, they have fewer subscribers than I do. But they ask, you know, how many subscribers do you have? It doesn't even matter what your guests are uh, because they want to sell so many books and they know that about 1% of a podcast audience will buy books. That's just a rule of publishing and they are a business. I don't blame them. They're a business. They have to run it like a business. Uh, and if I were running that business, cutthroat business, there's only so much attention. 1% of the audience will buy books is a rule of thumb that they use. Therefore, if, uh, if you guys buy books, or I'm not even imploring you guys to buy books, uh, but nevertheless, that's the rule of thumb. So that if I have 100,000 subs, 1,000 of you guys, 1,000 subs will buy books. That means that if their authors go on 10 of such podcasts, a million people will see it. That means 10,000 people will buy the books. That will definitely get a nonfiction author onto the New York Times bestseller list, which is all they really care about, because for the rest of their life, they can put down 
New York Times bestseller list. Now, my book was not a New York Times bestseller. Um, I actually had more sales than that. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, it didn't, you know, it was spread out over too long a period of time to count towards a bestseller list. I'm being totally honest. That's just the way that things work. Um, and it, it really doesn't matter. I wrote a book against the Nobel Prize. It's not like I'm looking for some accolades. Uh, that's not what matters. What I care about, again, my mission is I am a public uh, employee. I work for the state of California. I've been supported by NASA, the National Science Foundation, or the Department of Energy my whole life. Uh, I was a public um, school kid my whole life. I never attended a private school until I went to college, and I went to college on a scholarship. Um, so I never had advantages. I was always a byproduct of public school education. Uh, I owe you out there, you guys, I may never meet you. I mean, 28,000 people now it's grown 26,000, it's grown 10X, <laughs> almost, almost, you know, more than 10X uh, in a year. Uh, and, uh, and I just really treasure everybody out there. Uh, but the reason I want it to grow is so that I can get the people that you guys really wanna see to pay you back for the, uh, the gifts that you guys have given me and people like me. I believe it's my moral obligation as a publicly funded scientist to communicate to you in terms you can understand, to get guests like Seth, like um, uh, you know, like the Nobel Prize winning scientists that I've had on, and uh, and and the, the guests that you're interested in seeing. You know, I'm, I'm interested in getting people um, from all walks of life, and 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 um, and I love the suggestions that you guys are giving me. So please keep that up. Uh, that's my mission. That's all I care about. You'll never hear me saying, "Oh, I want a million subs. I want to." You know, people talk about getting subs for specific reasons. I'm telling you my metric. I'm a scientist. I think scientifically, quantitatively. That's the only reason that's what publishers care about and i won't talk about it any you know more than i need to uh but please do yeah share it with your family with your friends we'll get to that number and then i'll stop talking about it and uh the other thing that seems to make uh, a dent at youtube and i've spoken at google and and so forth and my friends there do tell me yeah commenting on every bit even if you just say commenting you know hi or whatever in the actual comment section these live chats are great but if you actually just put something high in the actual comment section that tends to tell YouTube that the, that folks are really interested. And if you hit the notification bell, it will send you an email as soon as I go live or whatever, or when I premiere a video like this one with Delilah Gates, please don't miss that one because I really want her career to just explode. She's going from Harvard to Princeton, as I said, second African-American in history woman to, to do what she's doing. Um, and you can say you heard her here first. She is a brilliant, uh, she's a beautiful individual in all possible ways. I, I cannot wait for you guys to see what she has in store for you. Uh, I hope that'll be on Tuesday. For now, I have to go uh, to uh, a telescopic, teleconic meeting. And I just enjoyed this so much, talking with you guys. And uh, <laughs> the universe expands into nothingness. Yeah, I'll put some of these up there. Hit the like button. Yeah, sure. Thank you guys so much. I really love it. Blah, blah. Thank you guys so much, Kieran. Uh, Gregory Chain, I don't know who that is, but I'll look into it. Um, yeah, absolutely, guys. Thank you so much. And for now, yeah, Frank Wilczek, I'm hoping to have him back. That's great. Sean Carroll. Yeah, I had all these guys on. You know, another thing that, that is a little bit uh, interesting is I had Noam Chomsky, Jim Simons, um, uh, Juan Maldes. I had all these guys on and women on, like Jill Tarter. You know, I had like 4,000, 2,000 subscribers. And now with the help from you guys, now I'm up to close to 30, you know, 28K. Um, now, you know, we could really leverage it and, uh, and get even more. And I want to get some great, some, some great new, new people that come out with new books. Brian Green, hope to have him on someday. Um, and, and with your help, we'll get there. So thank you all so much for being such great help and ambassadors and partners on this journey. I'm doing it uh, to, uh, to stoke imagination, to slake your curiosity, and to pay you guys back for all you do for my universe. So I'll take you out with a new uh, video produced by my uh, my, my intern, Sloan Sobe, Stuart Volkow, my super producer, Luca Scheinbach here at UC San Diego, and wherever they are in the multiverse, in the universe, and I'm gonna say goodbye. Till next week, guys, enjoy the weekend.